Um, hey everyone, uh, welcome to the, uh, what, what I'm having is 177 monthly meeting at the New York Linux Users Group. Um, tonight we're going to be hearing from Dr. Suresh uh, Gopalakrishna. Gopalakrishna, okay, I knew I was going to get that wrong. Um, uh, discussing, discussing enabling the AMD 64-bit ARM server ecosystem. Um, tonight, uh, we have a slightly abbreviated list of things we're asking you to not do. Uh, please make sure your phones are off so they don't make noise. Um, and please, we're not going to be taking questions during the presentation. What's going to happen is we are uh, broadcasting and recording the main part of the presentation and then question and answer. Uh, I guess we're going to get to be a little more candid. So we can turn off the cameras. You guys can ask whatever you want. But we're going to ask questions at the end. And we're going to come around with mics so everyone can hear you when you ask your questions. So just wait. Like when it comes time, wave your hand or something. We'll have other people. It's okay. Usual, thank you. Just wait for you. Um, I'd like to thank Google uh, and the people from Google who are here in uh, uh, this space and the last time we've been here. Um, I'd like to thank our other sponsors, for uh, IBM, Canonical, for Android Group, and Riley Media, uh, for their continued support. Uh, in addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our many volunteers who contribute greatly over the years and continue to. After the meeting, we would encourage everyone here to uh, join us for more talk and drinks at the bar in the Maritime Hotel. That's 363 West 16th Street. It's just off of uh, Ninth Avenue up here on 16th. Um, this is not our usual location, just like this meeting space is not our usual location. Um, so we'll have a couple of groups per normal going out there, so just you know, join us uh, on the way out. Um, our next meeting, this is the announcement section now, our next meeting will be a bonus meeting. We're going to have a second meeting in January at the Huffington Post. Uh, the talk is going to be about React, the cluster NoSQL database. Uh, I don't know if anyone here is a user of it, but it's an interesting technology. Um, for our February meeting, we're going to be having George Neville Neal do a comparative survey of previous meetings. Still him, right? Um, for a workshop from the location of our workshops has been the Hudson Library downtown, but unfortunately that is down for repairs until May. So in the meantime, if uh, anyone knows of a good alternative space, we are looking for that. We are still also looking for uh, other locations for the li uh, library system, etc. But if you have ideas, let us know. Uh, please talk to uh, Rob or David uh, here or back there with the cameras if you have ideas. We really appreciate it. you with that. And in case you missed it, there are DVDs of uh, various Linux distros in the back. So if you need one, want one, want to try something out, just don't want to spend the time downloading it, grab one on your way out or way in or whatever. Uh, but please, uh, we'd we like to see that table clear out every time because it's here for you. Now, uh, one more thing is that uh, I was told earlier today, and I didn't realize it, but Nylock has been operating these meetings for 15 years now, uh, as of this January. Is that right? 15 years? Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you. Uh, we do this for you. We, you know, every time these meetings come, we have new faces. We really, really appreciate you coming and joining us. Now, does anyone here have any announcements? No? Okay. Um, so please hold your questions until the end. And please welcome Dr. Suresh uh, Gopala Krishnan about enabling the AMD SIG what? Announcement. Let's do that at the bar. At the bar? Okay, right. so come and see me at the bar. But he's hired, so if anyone's interested. Um, so anyway, uh, enabling the AMD 64-bit ARM server. All right, everyone. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, and thank you for taking the time uh, to, to spend your spare time uh, with me today. Um, hopefully you get a pick up a few pieces of knowledge that are useful for you as you go along. 64-bit uh, uh, ARM servers are very nascent. They're all coming out. There's not uh, that many uh, pieces of hardware out there. Uh, and uh, um, you'll see that uh, uh, we ourselves are going to be sampling uh, lots in Q1. So in this quarter. So um, this is a preamble to all the things that are coming and the things that we're working on. Uh, a lot of, there are a lot of material about that you can go uh, find on the web, which, uh, a lot of things that I'm going to talk about are already available um, uh, for you to play with. Uh, I didn't put any links in here because I didn't think that anybody would be wanting to uh, write them down. So I will work with the organizers and get you a set of links um, that will uh, give you an idea of um, 
that you'll find on the So uh, with that, let me, uh, I, I don't like using agenda slides and topic slides, so I'm going to use a piece of paper to just give you a good theme of what I'm going to be talking about with that. You don't have to interpret the back of the agenda and topics like that. So I'm going to introduce AMD in the context of open source, what we are, what we, how we work with the community, uh, the type of activities we do. Um, then, before I get into the 64-bit uh, ARM ecosystem, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the changes in the group that uh, I see as I go around and talk to various, various customers and various uh, software and uh, hardware vendors. Um, that kind of give you an idea of why ARM and since it's perfectly good, why, why bother? So you get an idea of why um, when you look at that context. We'll talk a little bit about that. There's a bunch of Google folks here, so um, you'll forgive me when I talk about large data centers. Um, but, uh, um, but I want to show the context of the trends that are happening in those data centers and what's being picked up in the enterprise. So if you're on the enterprise side, those stuff there for you as well. Um, and then we'll, we'll jump into the ARM ecosystem and uh, what's going on and uh, what's the state of the ecosystem and what you'll see in the uh, I'm told that uh, there's a quiz at the end. Um, so uh, it's not like the, uh, uh, for site fans, it's not like there'll be a pineapple at the, uh, on the slides and you have to tell them exactly where the pineapple was. That's not the, the questions, but uh, um, I'm going to, uh, ask some stuff based on uh, based on this uh, presentation, but hopefully it'll be fun stuff. Uh, yeah. All right, let's get uh, started. Uh, my role at uh, AMD is to um, I, I actually have teams that build x86 processors as and ARM processors, and I have uh, uh, software teams that develop the software ecosystem around for both as well. So um, it gives me a unique perspective in terms of. Uh, doing this, I can do various comparisons that are uh, that that I have like uh, uh, you know feed from my my things. Uh, so let's get started here. So uh, introduction to AMD uh, as a um, uh, in terms of the open source. Um, I assume most people have heard about AMD. <laughs> yeah, sorry, got your head nods, So. Um, so uh, we contribute to, to the various uh, open source uh, activities. We are one of the top 20 contributors to Linux, Kano, uh, the board member of Linux Foundation, Zen Advisory Board, uh, Linaro, I'll talk about Linaro a bit uh, later on, this is the ARM, uh, that's one of the key players in the ARM ecosystem building, so we've been talking a bit about that. The co-sponsor of the Software Foundation, but I can tell you today, all the, all the distributions. Uh, I just put the main ones out, but uh, even folks like CentOS and others who work with them as well. But even now CentOS is very happy to get it together. So, uh, but we do work with all, you know, all, the, all the major and minor distributions that are out there. Let's so. talk so about computing. So it really sounds like, I mean, today, if you go look at type of things that are happening, you know, you have touch, you have um, gestures, you have biometric recognition, you have, uh, um, you know, content is everywhere, you're getting into wearable computing. Uh, um, I, I don't know whether I want the other people to know how much exercise or not, but uh, the quantified self-movement is kind of getting, uh, getting that uh, done with wearable computing. But when all of these things happen, it is not necessarily just the um, the enterprise ERP or the enterprise database that is now running in the, in the, in the data center. So um, enterprises may not see uh, the employees wearable computing stuff, but a lot of applications that are being developed out there are collecting these kind of uh, data. Uh, and when any piece of data comes from any of these sources, they're all uh, interacting with each other. So if somebody makes a, a, a request, right? so even if I make it just a, hey, I want to know what happened to the CentOS Red Hat um, announcement, I do a search, um, there's so much information about me out there that as soon as my search goes out there, uh, I don't have to tell the Google folks this, but you know, immediately they say, oh, this is Suresh, he has 
you know, he likes to see videos and he has letters to start about 10 seconds. So we have to give him that. And by the way, he was looking for a computer bag. So um, let's figure out uh, how to give him some computer bag access. At the same time. So, so I, I just figured a whole pile of activities going on just by my requesting it. So, uh, news. So, um, so every one of these, these interactions creates a, a flurry of activities within the data center. Whether you are um, you know, trying to sell ads, whether you're doing social networking stuff, or whatever it is. So, computing really surrounds says, uh, you know, people use all of this biometrical information quite a bit. Right? Whenever you're walking around anywhere, um, there's so much cameras out there, and uh, hopefully it's not as sophisticated as NCIS and other shows um, show us, but um, uh, it is uh, uh, it, it is right there. So, when that um, in that context, when you look at it, it is multi-platform, right? You have glasses, um, you know, I'm going to get at least one glass, it's good, but, um, you know, it's from glasses to room size, right? I mean, if you look at some of the immersive things that people are doing, um, it is, you know, they have surround environments where you can go play games. Right? It, is, it is really, um, really very realistic output coming out from there. Uh, if you have tried to um, offer this virtual reality thing, um, you know, if you look down, down, you will you feel you feel dizzy when you're you know, in height wearing that. So, um, and it is uh, it's natural UI um, to um, very realistic output. Um, to give you a, a, a silly example here, I got this touch touch screen computer. Right, I'm going to get touch screen back. So, who needs it, right? So. Um, but once you get it and you're used to doing things on there, you're suddenly you know, sitting there going, okay, well, I want to zoom this. You, know, you, you have the same interface there. Um, and um, the, the, the funny story was a, um, from a friend, friend of mine. He was, he was telling me, watch his son. Right? I mean, the, the kid is sitting there with a cardboard book, and he's trying to do this. Because he plays with dad's iPad for most of the time. And he's sitting with the book and doing this. And my friend is enjoying this. but. Um, you know, we had a laugh about it, but it was kind of fun. Um, and, um, and it's intelligent. Uh, it is today uh, serving us ads and uh, giving us you know, recommendations and stuff like that. Um, tomorrow it will probably do this more. It will try to predict what we want and try to do stuff as we go on. So with all of these changes, um, if you look at data center architecture, um, and most of um, the uh, the big data centers, they support large number of users and devices. Um, and in, in some cases, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, a, a Facebook or a social net, large social networking uh, company. Uh, think about companies that are uh, taking data from, from your Fitbits and other devices. Right? And there's a lot of data that, that, that can come in. Uh, look at the cars. Um, that you can see now the uh, onboard diagnostic port based uh, analytics are available. So you have a million, two million cars coming in and uh, throwing data at you. Uh, it, it could be small, small bytes, but um, you know it, it's a lot of it coming at you at the same time. So you're, you're seeing that. So we are kind of seeing some of the trends of these large data centers coming into some of these applications that are cloud based. And you have to uh, scale end-to-end uh, -end security. Uh, think about all of that good Fitbit data sitting out there. Um, it has been really, really secure. Uh, you will violate all kinds of healthcare uh, laws if you don't do that. So it has to be end-to-end -end security and accelerate the, uh, accelerate the response to reduce latency. Uh, because uh, most people um, who run a lot of data, data uh, data centers and serve web pages uh, always uh, are worried about how many milliseconds it takes to display a page. Uh, the anecdotal information is that if it's more than 800 milliseconds, uh, the user goes to a different site. So our attention span is, is getting very, very low. Uh, uh, and um, uh, some of my customers who, who run this, I can't tell you their names, but one of them told me that if I have more than 800 milliseconds, the customer is going to go to a competitor site. Um, these are all social media. Um, you know, kind of, uh, so, um, and 
when you have that kind, that number of users and devices and that number of servers coming along, you have power and uh, cooling and uh, all kinds of stuff that you need to take care of. So you need to be power efficient and have uh, sufficient compute density. Each of these topics you could go on for, for hours uh, discussing and debating uh, because some of these things are controversial as well. But you, this is the context in which we are we're kind of coming in. But what I see in this is not as, as problems, but there's so many opportunities that are being presented here. In terms of how you handle it, how you secure it, how you make it power, uh, power efficient, density. So, to me, I think this is opening up a whole new, um, new era of innovation and, um, and uh, problem solving that's coming. So new workloads coming in, and all of these have profound impact on the server architecture. So, um, you know, you, you have um, heard how. Google and other big data centers have gone and done their own custom versions of servers and stuff like that. Um, you know, you'll see more and more um, architectural changes coming in in those those areas to, to accommodate the power, cooling, uh, latency requirements, the storage requirements. So you're going to see a lot of changes coming into the server world from that, and that that's really exciting for uh, folks like me because we are designing the chips that go into it. So. Uh, we get to uh, see it and play with it uh, years before it comes out into the market. So, uh, redundant for some of the folks here, but uh, what are you going to see as uh, as the future of data centers? Uh, the large data centers are getting to be football field size or, or bigger uh, with uh, pods of uh, servers, uh, sometimes thousands of servers in those pods, and what that introduces is the problem of the, or what I would like to call the anonymous uh, you know, uh, Linux server. Because, um, I'm going to take myself if I tell you, but, um, yeah, but with the gray airs, you can probably uh, assume that. But I used to have a pet uh, workstation, Linux workstation. It had a name. It was called Firebug. And, um, you know, everybody knew Firebug was the server and all of those kind of things, but those days are gone. Right now, um, you know, it, it, a VM will be assigned to me uh, when I go to bed, and um, you know, all of those things are just numbered or you know, some, some random string of um, things that make some algorithmic sense is how you're going to go to this. So you have to at scale manage these these devices. Um, so that's also becoming uh, very important as we go there. And then comes the next step is. The first set of data centers, and even today, the things that are getting built, everyone wants to keep it as homogeneous as possible, so that um, you know it's the same same instance. If I can fill my entire data center with just one SKU, I would try to do that because it's easier to manage, it's easier to operate, etc. But as we get to that, get away from that homogeneity because of the different type of workloads that are coming in, um, you know, there, there is a lot of move to figure out. Okay, how do we make some workload optimized ones which are more power efficient for um, for this particular type of activity? Uh, early days of it, uh, there are uh, what you will see is in most cases um, you you will see uh, very specialized FPGA engines being uh, attached to uh, processors to kind of take some acceleration, <coughs> whatever workload it is. So, and that is one of the reasons that people want some ability to do that kind of customization, accelerators, et cetera, to processors, because FPGAs, again, are sitting on the side of more expensive, et cetera, et cetera. So people want to see some kind of customized processors coming in uh, into, into, the, uh, uh, into the data center. So uh, this is kind of a uh, uh, context in terms of the large data centers and people who are directly dealing with uh, millions of users or devices talking to, talking to the data center. But if you look at the enterprise, you can see that over the last 10 years or so, a lot of the things that a hardware or software concept or, or how you build data centers have kind of migrated from, um, it's not an exact copy, but people look at it and say, hey, you know, this is this is good. How do we adapt it to the, to the enterprise? Uh, so uh, you'll see uh, there's a lot more things in here that you can see the data um, you know, analysis being done with the root framework or using um, Cassandra or, or even open computer, which is more of a hardware uh, concept. <coughs> so um, people came and said, how do you 
um, try and get the same kind of purchasing uh, power and um, multi-sourced um, uh, hardware for the data center. So that's where the open compute uh, stuff came in. Uh, what was designed for the large data center was not exactly what the enterprises wanted. They wanted something that looked very you know, near and dear to them, so they wanted to um, go get a two-socket server um, that they could go buy from multiple people and the management would all be the same, so they could use that. So that was the concept behind the open compute, and uh, uh, that, that's the mode uh, in the enterprise. Uh, so some, some actual tools, um, some uh, concepts, um, some uh, uh, purchasing techniques, all of those things are migrating from the enterprise over here. So, um, and I think the adoption rate of those things are, are accelerating. So you'll see these things. Um, I remember talking to, it, to it, an audience and I said, how many of you run uh, 100,000 servers? Uh, it's a trick question because the guys who run more than 100,000 servers cannot raise their hands. Um, and um, so most likely you won't get any hands up. Um, but um, you know, afterwards when we have conversations, people I have only a few hundred servers, so I was a simplistic back. So, uh, but a lot of things, a lot of these applications come into the enterprise. Uh, so, uh, so if you solve the, the bigger problems, then you can anticipate uh, some of the needs of the enterprise as you go along. Right. So we talk about a lot of changes on compute, uh, but server architectures are just beginning to adapt. Uh, and, um, you know, you, you'll see um, a, a bunch of, um, oops, that's what I'm famous for, uh, Shevich's impressions. Um, I see a lot of young folks here, so you may not know who Shevich is. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, so if you look at, and I, I've tried to put some of these workloads and give you an idea of where uh, you will see some of the um, intersections with ARM and x86 and some of the parallel processing uh, activities that are coming in. So, um, so if you look at um, uh, some of the web services, uh, memcache, uh, analytics, Hadoop, etc., you will see uh, x86 and ARM kind of overlapping there as you go forward. Uh, if it comes to compute clusters that need large amounts of parallel processing, it's either single position or double position, uh, or even just using the um, shading engines and others in GPUs to do parallel processing. Um, you'll see a lot of those things in image rendering, machine learning, um, seismic data analysis, and so on and so forth. Uh, traditional HPC kind of workloads um, are the ones that uh, try and use that. And then there are media clusters. There's so much media out there um, and biometrics that are going along with it. So you see everything from a simple hosted desktop, uh, they call it simple, but when you try to implement it, it is it's, it's really thought out. Uh, most of desktop, facial recognition, remote gaming. Um, you know, re remote gaming, it gets uh, interesting when your bandwidth, last mile bandwidth is really, really good. Uh, and uh, uh, in my previous uh, life, we used to sell uh, switches and routers that, uh, to countries that had uh, 100 megabit or even gigabit Ethernet connections going into, into homes. Uh, and um, those countries also had good big time gaming, uh, places like Japan, Korea. And uh, the thing was that you know, those switches and routers you know, had to be more reliable than even your phone network because they pay for uh, ammo, right? And it lasts for um, X, you know, X minutes or whatever it is. And if, you, if your network is slow or any of those things happen, you know, they lose money. So, uh, uh, so you have remote gaming, you have video transcoding uh, coming up. So there's a bunch of different activities that are, that are happening in there. Uh, I deliberately kept off of uh, search and other things, but those are also looking at the uh, acceleration uh, engines there. So um, you, you'll see uh, these type of workload optimized uh, processing coming along in the, uh, in the future. So uh, why does ARM make sense in the, um, in, in the server land? You'll hear people talk about okay, low power and all of those kind of things. But um, uh, my take at it is that if you take two equally capable design teams and give them a 
power target or a performance target, they will go ahead. Uh, if you give a very high performance target, uh, it's going to burn power because you need you need that. So uh, you know, some thinking about hey, you know, the, uh, the chip in the phone. I'm still the phone here, but the chip in the phone. Um, you know, can it do uh, the, the, all the uh, performance that is needed in a server? Uh, the answer is no. So you'll need a different uh, design point to get that, uh, that, that performance. And uh, um, so that's one. But the thing that is most interesting to people are the ability to tune workloads um, and uh, also uh, the amount of innovation that can go around it. So if you have your own um, version of it and you have a lot of competition uh, going on, you, you can, you'll see that um, people will specialize in areas when it comes to competition. So there will be a 64-bit ARM um, uh, server uh, chip. Uh, but somebody who has a DSP capability is going to say, okay, I'm going to put some DSP capability. Right? So if your application requires a lot of DSP capabilities, you have it. Along with the, the CPU. You will not get them in an uh, x86 environment. Um, if you have um, you know, uh, some people will have a lot of networking capabilities because that's their um, their specialty. So you'll have a lot of packet processing capabilities built in along with uh, along with the, the ARM processor. So that allows you to go look at okay for my networking centric areas, I can go to uh, take that process and put it, put it in place. So these are the, the main reasons. Um, if you ultimately look at the instruction sets and um, what can be done with them. Uh, there are certain things that, from a software point of view, will um, give a little bit of edge to ARM. I'll, I'll cover that in a, uh, a little bit later. The first one is, from a hardware implementation point of view, uh, the ARM uh, ISA does not have to carry all the legacy uh, kind of instruction that x86 carries. So there is some inherent uh, decode uh, uh, speed up that can be achieved for the, uh, for the ARM ones. But, uh, there are some stuff in software that is um, that's even more interesting in terms of page sizes and number of registers and stuff like that that you can, you can leverage. So, so what's AMD's goal in doing all of these things? Um, so, we want to give that choice um, to to customers. So, we will continue to have traditional x86 um, um, CPUs, and uh, we have um, some of the leading uh, display GPUs. Uh, in the world. So we are bringing the compute capabilities of that along with the x86 um, uh, CPU capabilities together. So some in case of parallel processing, etc., you have a unified memory approach where uh, the CPU and the GPU uh, can take, uh, can address the same, same memory and uh, it's a much more efficient way of uh, doing GPU-based uh, acceleration. Um, what we are looking for is not to replace the uh, the big graphics engines, they have a lot of cores there, um, and um, they're very, very um, powerful. What we are trying to do is that there is that, um, that knee up that curve in terms of the application performance and size where you can, if you put the CPU and the GPU together on a single die, there's a certain class of applications where this is the most power optimal way of doing it because you don't have a lot of transfers back and forth between, uh, between these, these two uh, devices. And then the AR64, which is the ARM64 um, um, instruction set. But the success of uh, any processor, for that matter, depends on the ecosystem that gets built on ARM. And, um, and that is, that's true for ARM servers as well. So uh, you know, th this is where um, things could have gone wild and crazy. but. Uh, Everybody got together and said that, okay, people are looking for a choice and competition and stuff like that. There needs to be some similarity in how things are done. Otherwise, uh, it's not really competition. It's that you, know, you develop one for one guy and then you develop code for another guy and then it's all uh, back to the phone days or um, embedded development days. So uh, we need to have um, operating systems. We need to have uh, the firmware uh, that is standard. Uh, we need to have um, Java, we need to have tools, we need to have um, um, you know, applications like that. Um, so you need to build a whole pile of things uh, there. And 
Early on, everybody realized this, right? As Al moves from gadgets and embedded devices into, uh, into, into the server wall, um, we didn't want to get a re replication of, of this thing going on here, which is the uh, you know, various flavors of things that are being run on On the uh, uh, on, on that, that particular 32-bit device in this case, and now getting to 64 bit in the phones. So, uh, so the, the the thought there was, um, you know, we want to avoid the, the chaos that can come in if everybody's doing different things around it. So, how do you make make, make sure that the development community has something that they can um, develop on? Uh, and two things came in, you know, drive Linux technologies common to ARM SOCs because uh, for example, somebody could have DSPs in there, somebody could have graphics in there, somebody could have uh, networking uh, processors, uh, networking, networking uh, accelerators in there. But in spite of all of those things, the base coding should be the same. Uh, that was about, even if the multiple associate providers do that. And then we are a strong proponent of using the standards so that um, we don't have different ways of booting, different ways of secure, you know, securing things, and different ways that the devices will communicate back to the OS on um, you know, what the power state is or whatever else that we want to go look at. So these, these were the early insights and um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, happy to report that overall all the SOC vendors and the software uh, players who are there building the software infrastructure uh, have all paid heed to this um, and uh, that's a good thing. So let me talk about how the ecosystem is being developed. So there's a lot of uh, players out here. I'm sure that I'm missing a few, but the, uh, the bigger ones uh, are all here. Um, and this is all being spearheaded by, uh, by a group called Lenaro. Um, and the idea here is that all the folks who are on, on this side of it contribute uh, engineers and funding uh, for developing that common uh, Linux uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, so, uh, you know, AMD has people in there, uh, all these other uh, teams that contribute to engineers. It's not one of these cases where you can just contribute money to it, you need to have contribute money and people um, who have specific tasks that they need to go to. Uh, so, uh, at, at last count, there's 200 plus open source software engineers from all these companies who are working on, on, the, on the infrastructure. I'll, I'll talk about how this leads into distributions in, in a second. Um, so the goal there is to be distribution agnostic, develop the tools, the, uh, the tool chain, power management, Linux kernel, uh, and even getting into uh, some of the firmware aspects as well. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, we contribute to that, and we are also working on developing standards-based uh, firmware for the part that we will sample uh, this quarter. So, so if you look at that, how does, how does this work? So as I mentioned before, tools, kernel, um, some of the applications the Linaro team members uh, are working on. And then, um, you know, I haven't put the other distributions in here, but uh, Fedora, um, uh, Ubuntu, um, RHEL, you know, the, um, uh, SUSE, everybody has uh, plans of taking that and distributing it out. Uh, and um, the, um, the Linaro Enterprise Group, um, their charters provide that common software um, environment for all the ARM SOCs, 64 bit SOCs that are out there. Yeah. And, uh, and the distributions have all signed up for, uh, for this as well. So, what about Java? That's the other, other thing that, that's very important. Uh, I think, uh, um, you know, last count it was like between 9 and 10 million developers rely on Java. So there is uh, already um, work from Red Hat to Denaro on major contributors to JDK for uh, AR64. Um, and I think in uh, July of uh, last year, um, Arm and uh, uh, Oracle announced that they're going to be working on um, adding the 64 um, bit support to Java SE. So that, that's also work in, work in progress. So there's a strong um, uh, set of developers working on getting uh, open, the open JD, either OpenJDK or Java IC uh, for uh, Java support on, on 64. And 
mentioned before, you know, the uh, uh, MDs using standards-based firmware development. <coughs> One of the things that we found out was that uh, throughout the history of x86, people have come up with standards in uh, you know, very well-defined ways of uh, uh, you know, communicating between the various uh, layers of software. Uh, there's no need to go reinvent uh, those things, and these are uh, open standards uh, with open governing bodies, so it's not controlled by some particular um, uh, company. So uh, we decided that we would uh, do it that way. So it would be compatibility with existing uh, data center infrastructure, um, development environments, um, system building, all of those things will be very similar between the two uh, if you follow those standards. And the functionality is, is predictable and, and, and stable. We are not uh, you know, coming up with a brand new standard on top of the brand new ISA to so um, that is, uh, th that, that's a set of benefits that you get. Um, I'm not going to bore you with all, a, a whole bunch of um, standards here, but uh, UEFI is, is, is very important. Uh, it is, uh, um, you know, that, that, that's a very clean interface between voice and, and the firmware uh, at full time. Uh, you don't need to go deep with that. Uh, this is what the NARO teams are also working on. So uh, what you'll find out is that uh, you know, the, the standard is there, but there is already a um, uh, firmware development kit, if you would, uh, available uh, for uh, ARM64 out there. Uh, and uh, uh, the good thing was that it was being supported for 32-bit ARM, so it was easy to kind of move forward with 64 bit cases. So uh, th this one uh, is also available. And then the next thing was the, the configuration and uh, uh, the power interface. And how do you, uh, because all these devices have to communicate back to us and say, okay, here's, here's what state I'm in, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, again, uh, nothing proprietary, everything is open, so why not leverage that? So that is what we are using for, um, for the, the config and uh, power interface. We're looking at uh, you, know, you can go back to storage. Um, there's no re need to go reinvent ANCI or any of those kind of uh, standards. So uh, our firmware, our um, approach is, is completely standards-based. Uh, so if you're used to an x86 environment in, in developing and building systems and stuff like that, you have quite a environment. And, uh, you know, uh, by, by the way, you know, the um, the traditional BIOS windows are also uh, all supportive of this kind of approach as well. So you can see them participate in this. Uh, I'll stop with one more standard out here, which is the uh, uh, the, S, uh, the SM BIOS, and uh, uh, this was another one that uh, that was very important when you're when you're building your own system. So uh, this is under the the MTF uh, uh, .org. Um, so this again open and available. By the way, there was this, a change that happened uh, later uh, last year, which was the UEFI forum actually uh, took over the ACPI governance. So this is way more transparent and uh, you know, more like the UEFI itself. So, um, so um, there's a whole bunch of other, other bunch of standards that we usually use on the XI side here. Uh, we're making sure that we follow good standards that are there um, give it a uh, good development and one for, for everybody. Um, now getting back a little bit into um, AMD's processor, um, uh, we, we are uh, we are about to uh, uh, do a sample of Q1 uh, 2014 is something that um, you know we had announced um, early, uh, probably in the middle of last year. Um, we'll, we'll continue to do that. And, uh, we have a new processor coming in, ADOM Cortex A57 cores, um, 128 uh, for CPU, uh, and there are offload engines uh, there. Uh, there's a little bit of 10D, a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of There's a whole bunch of stuff that is being, so th these are, uh, CPUs are getting to be all SOCs, you know, uh, systems on chips, you know, call servers on chip, because almost everything that you need out uh, is in there. Uh, so, um, so that, that, that is the processor in there, and then I get this question all the time, you know, what are, you know, uh, 
Yeah, some of these things are, these are not compare and contrast, uh, although it looks like that when you look in the table. But uh, folks ask me, uh, are some of these things, you know, like the SIMD or uh, is virtualization supported, is security supported? Um, yeah, they're, all, they're all equivalent pieces, but if you look at x86, you'll see some familiar names there, but there are some names there, uh, on that. The in interesting things are here in terms of registers. Uh, for the most part, it looks the same, but if you look at the general purpose registers are available, that's about 31 of them. That is uh, pretty uh, interesting when it comes to uh, programming class. Um, so in, in most part, uh, anything that you can do on this side, you can go do on this side as well. And uh, let's go to this thing. And uh, in terms of Seattle, what is what's available out there uh, today? Because you know we, we can simulate, we can emulate, we can we can do all these things today. Is uh, there's the Fedora uh, release? Uh, Red release is, is later on. Uh, Leonardo has a stable kernel available. Uh, open Lucy has, has uh, uh, AR64 support out there. Um, Ubuntu also has support out there. Uh, Linux uh, 3.7 by itself. This is where everybody upstream everything first. Uh, and then these guys are starting to do stuff. Um, Zen and KVM already has have programs on there. You should be seeing them coming up uh, shortly. Um, and uh, um, you know, I, I think I'll, I'll work with Brian or, or you and see. The, uh, you know, my team gave me a whole bunch of links with this uh, that will just fill the, the entire page so I can put them here. So um, I'll make sure that you're interested in getting those things. So these things are all available for download right now. But, uh, so this is the, uh, the, the model. So if you want to play at that level, you can take that model and uh, run all these uh, tools on uh, the uh, distributions and tools on them. And uh, what should you uh, kind of expect from uh, from AMD when AMD says something is about the sample is that uh, you will see firmware, you will see SOC drivers that are in there, um, and uh, you know, we'll also have a development platform, uh, a hardware development platform, so that you can um, run um, uh, run code on it. That's what we want to test. So uh, keep an eye out for. Uh, our sampling announcement will come out uh, sometime in Q1. Uh, and then, um, on closing thoughts, uh, uh, there's, a, um, there's a huge disruptive pro uh, potential out there uh, for 64-bit ARM. Uh, it is not going to be like tomorrow, it's going to take over 100% uh, of x86. Uh, it will be built. Uh, there's a lot of competition, good competition that will come with it, a lot of innovation that comes with it. But it's a clean slate design, so there's no software legacy uh, in here. So uh, think about 64-bit only development. Think about you know, using a lot of page sizes in the 64 k pages um, uh, for that. Um, and uh, you, you'll see different kinds of uh, benchmarks because most of these devices are going to get tuned for um, different types of numbers. And you'll see different kind of maxes like yourself there as well. And then, um, you know, uh, being open and being having everything, you, you could go by the best and develop your own. Uh, but if you stick to some of the uh, fav you know, favorite and good standards, uh, that would be a good thing. Uh, and uh, most of the ecosystem partners are all following that. So that might be a good thing to keep in mind. And most of this is downloadable today, what I talked about. Uh, and uh, it's all waiting for hardware to come so that you can see we had actually run on hardware. But if you use the data that I mentioned before, you can run it on. And then up next is you know, optimization. You're, you're seeing compilers come out. You're seeing these tools come out. They all will get optimized. You're seeing applications come out. They will be tuned and optimized when hardware comes in. That's, that's what's up next um, in this, this tool of development. And, uh, it. That's my uh, main part of it. I usually talk very fast, so you know, that last about two hours that was promised. Uh, but uh, um, I would uh, love to turn over and let you ask questions. Uh, and um, you know, we are in our quiet period, uh, so I cannot answer certain type of questions, but uh, um, you know, I'm ready to um, answer questions.